because what I do awesome introductions here at Hashtag Sports. You may recognize this guy from uh, many broadcasts and more, more so the podcast. They have the Rock Pile Report. The guy in the back seat, you may not have seen too much since he's the man behind the camera, behind the voice, uh, just the serial one-liner of Rock Pile Report. <laughs> That would be, uh, be Chris Kruger and Drew Gear. Guys, make sure you give them a follow. I'm going to have it in the description down here. Make sure you give them a follow. They're on Podbean. Their podcast is awesome. It's a great fan show. Season ticket holder Drew Gear and uh, Derek Carr lover uh, Chris Kruger. So be sure you guys do that. <laughs> Chris has spent years trying to convince anybody who would listen that Derek Carr is elite. We had that one good year, and then he broke his leg, and he went full on Trent Edwards. <laughs> They should have they put him down. Scared. So what, what it sounds like to me is you're saying they should have put him down like a horse after he broke his leg. Yes. All right. Kentucky Derby treatment. We're talking <laughs> about we're talking about the draft and the run up to the draft. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> right now with the with the combine happening, you know, it's it's one of the things that a lot of fans are focused on. Is that why Paul's not here? That's exactly why Paul's not here. <laughs> He's the only human being I know who would take time out of his life to watch men built like refrigerators wrapped in saran wrap running around. He loves the combine. He is amazing. It's so fascinating to me that he loves the combine so much, but he hates the Wonderland. See, in the, and so in this week's podcast, we did my annual rant about why I think the combine stinks. And I, <laughs> and I run it down from top to bottom. I mean, just to give your listeners a taste of it, first of all. I understand why some of these things matter. I do. Uh, you know, do you, three cone drill. It matters because you're looking to test a player's change of direction skills. Mm-hmm. The first ten, you know, for offensive linemen, you're not looking at their forty time, but seeing how quickly they run those first ten, uh, yeah, first ten meters, they're going to run forty yards. Shows you there's exp- how what, where they how they can be explosive in a short area. Mm-hmm. But to the person like Paul sitting at home on his couch watching it. You don't know the difference between one three-cone drill and another. So, to me, it's more helpful or it's more worthwhile to sit back and watch someone catalog all the data and hand it to you. I'm a data guy. Give me the numbers. I work in finance. Give me the numbers, and I can kind of discern who did better than who and what's good, what's bad. In real time, watching it play out, I have no idea what I'm looking at. I'm looking at dudes running in circles. What do you guys want I want the Wineski special. What is that? Two Boston cream donuts? No. As far as the combine goes, I mean, I, I like certain parts of the combine. <clears throat> the interview process is probably my favorite part. Yeah. Because you don't hear anything it, about it, but it's one of the most critical things that happens. Is it? Yeah, Jeff Ireland. Is, is it really? I yeah. think you need to start talking to some of these guys, especially if you scouted him. You scouted him. You know what he's like on the field. Okay. What is this guy's? It, Leotis McKelvin? This guy can't put together a sentence. What are we going to do with him? Well, you're certainly not going to stick him in front of a microphone. Well, I'm yeah. you have to. Oh, how many how many uh, syllables is that word? Oh, six. I'm going to condense it to one. <laughs> the one guy said, what's your favorite route? He was talking to wide receivers. And he said, well, I like the nine route. Like, that's it? Like, yeah, that's my only route I like. I mean, it, I, I would not, I would not put an investment <laughs> into that guy. No, I, as I guess far I, as that goes. I guess I understand what you're saying then from that standpoint because it's it is one of those things where you do get a feel for the player. Counterpoint to why you think this is important. Here's my counterpoint. <clears throat> there are a lot of stupid questions that get asked. Questions Ooh. someone Hey uh, Des Bryant, is your mother a <laughs> recently so 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 what is it? Two or three years ago, someone asked the defensive at Austin Lane. He's now an MMA fighter. He's not even a, he's not even in the NFL anymore. But the question was posed to him whether or not he found his mother attractive. Now I don't know why you're asking me that. I don't know the connotation behind it or the tone of voice put to it. But I'll tell you this: it's disturbing. If you ask me that question on the wrong day, I don't care who you are. If it's not you, then it's your assistant. Or it's the guy who parked your car. Somebody's getting put in a headlock. That's it. I'm not talking about the tone or the questions themselves being asked. I, I understand that. That is preposterous. However, the questions, like, let's just say this. Chris is on Tinder, right? Or was? I was years ago. Okay, years ago. You basically swipe right for someone you find attractive, correct? 
Yeah, and you, were, you also click on their profile. Okay, they have a profile, just like a draft profile. Mm -hmm. You're able to see them and read about their profile. But if you didn't have a chance to talk to that person, like if Chris swiped right and said, all right, I'm going to take this girl on five dates. All right, it's already guaranteed. We're going on five dates. We're going to go on vacation. We're going to go on a cruise. But he goes, and the girl's voice is deeper than his. Like It's actually kind of hot. <laughs> I'm just saying, the, the able to, being able to communicate with some of these guys that you may draft, plus it could throw a little smoke screen. That's what I like about it. It's like, hey, he's talking to these three defensive linemen, <clears throat> you know, and they're ahead of us. So maybe we got to do something during our draft to get ahead of them because we want one of those guys, and we expect the two other ones are going to be taken before him. But I, I like what, it about it. Kind of like what uh, came out uh, last week on the Dolphins. Oh, they might be interested in uh, Justin, uh, Herbert. Justin Herbert. Yes. So see, there again, that could be a smoke screen. That could be a number of things. That's what I love from the end of the season until they actually get drafted is the greatest no limit hold them Texas game, Texas no limit hold them game ever. Well, I and, love it. And so th there is a lot that goes into that. Now, to put a little bit of a Bills spin on this, yep. you know, we got used to a GM in Doug Whaley who had some egregious tells. Mm -hmm. He never drafted a prospect that didn't make one of the 21 visits here to Buffalo. To the facility. Really? If, yeah. If he, during okay. his tenure, he wouldn't draft outside of guys who came in for a visit. Hmm. At least in the first first three or four rounds. Well, I guess you could take that either way. You could. Know, that makes sense. But so, Brandon Bean has shown that he's a little more of a wild card. Mm -hmm. So this week on the podcast, we were breaking it down with Dean Kindig, who works over at DraftTech.com. And what he does is he charts the scouting activity of our entire scouting department over the course of a season breaks it down into what games have they attended because you can get the records on who was credentialed for the game as a scout. Mm -hmm. You can get the what games not only was our scouting department present for, how many times they attended games that that team played, whether uh, an assistant GM was present, whether Brandon Bean himself went to the game and took the game in. That's a lot of intel. It is. And so what he does is he spends the season charting all this data so that you can kind of get a feel for what the team might be thinking because they're not going to waste their own time. Yeah. There are smoke screens, but then there's also, hey, look at the these teams that they're putting the most eyes on. Who are the relevant players on the field at the time? Hmm. And you can, because I'm a junkie for data analysis, you can start breaking that down and find some patterns and find some interesting things then when you take that and extrapolate it against what most you know, mock drafts, and where most analysts believe a player's value really sits. So this week on the show, you know, we went into this, everyone's going into this draft with kind of, a, as fans, a preconceived notion of what this team needs in order to be successful. Yeah. Now, Mario, if you had to pick, what do you think the two, two positions the Bills, in your opinion, must address in the early rounds of the draft? What would they be? Tackle and corner. Okay. See? Now, that's some outside-the-box thinking, because we put it to a poll, and it turns out most fans are in love with the idea of the early round early round wide receiver. Yes. yes. Okay? Yes. So then, would it shock you to hear that out of all the draft draftable talent in this draft, mm -hmm. the Buffalo Bills have only put eyes on 10 offensive tackles. Games that they've attended, that they've taken in, that they've been on the field. Only 10 in terms of guys who are significant names in the draft. There may be some late round kind of guys that I'm not, that aren't being taken into consideration here. Yeah. But if you're looking at guys that would go in the top three, there's top three or four, there's 10 guys okay. that they've gone and personally scouted yep. or that Brandon Bean himself has taken time to visit. Of those 10 guys, five of them are considered first round talents. There we go. Three of them are considered second to third round talents. Okay. Which, now if you're a fan who's out here saying, well, the Buffalo Bills absolutely have to take a wide receiver. Wide receiver is a cherry on top to your offense. I think we have more holes on our offensive line, and I'm with Mario, that we should take a tackle early. So now for someone who thinks tackles should be a priority, how does that make you feel knowing that the team has put a considerable amount of effort to scouting early round of tackle talent? Well, that's, I mean, I look at it from... The standpoint of you look at the the top ten uh, offensive linemen that are going to be up for free agency. Seven of the ten of them are over thirty, so it's not a long term solution that you're talking about there. You have to make a decision on Deion Dawkins, which I feel they have. You look at Cody Ford, um, who 
had significant playing time at tackle, but everyone still thinks, well, not everyone, I don't want to say that, but a lot of people still think that if you put him at guard, he's amazing. Quentin Spain and Feliciano are not your long-term solutions no. either. So if you want to think about building a line, a sustainable line that's cheap, obviously you're going to do it through the draft. And as far as you know, scouting those guys, because of the wide receiver talent, because of the quarterbacks that may go, because of – and this is like cause and effect. So if all those guys are gone, instead of getting the fifth best wide receiver – and everyone knows, I'm not saying that Bills don't need a wide receiver, but if you're getting the fifth best wide receiver, why not get the second best tackle in the draft? Well, and so this is the thing. It's how do you want to build your offense? And, you know, last offseason we spent time talking about how the Jets and the Bills were going to be an interesting case study yes. because the Jets decided to build their team from the outside in. They went out in free agency and picked up a lot of what? They picked up multiple wide receivers. Yes. They got skill position players. Mm-hmm. They kind of ignored the offensive line. Yep. You know, they brought in Le'Veon Bell, but they didn't. They kind of cheaped out on the line. They ignored the trenches. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, their team was a disaster because they couldn't they couldn't establish a running game. Le'Veon Bell was not as effective, and he had the lowest yards before contact in his entire career. Kind of like what happened to LaShawn McCoy in 2018 playing behind a bad Buffalo Bills offensive line. <clears throat> Whereas the Bills put a lot of their efforts and onus on building up the trenches. You, re, you brought back a Jordan Phillips. You went in and brought in five free agent signings on the offensive line to try to figure out who was going to be your guys, and you saw that pay dividends as the season went on. Yeah. It hurt you in some cases because you didn't have that premier wide receiver talent, Yeah, but you were strong enough in the trenches that your rushing attack could sustain you. So on the flip side of that, we just get done talking about how they focus on offensive tackles early a lot. You talk about the, the two, and it makes sense. The two, the two wide receivers who they put eyes on, according to Dean Kinbig's data, the most were T. Higgins and Lavisca Chanel, who are two of the wide receivers who are most commonly mock drafted to the Bills, because they're the ones who everyone expects to be available in the ballpark of the twenty-second pick. Yes, but they spent just as much time viewing guys like Justin Jefferson out of LSU. Uh, Brian Edwards out of South Carolina, mm-hmm. Chase Claypool out of Notre Dame. Yes. Each one of those prospects got at least three scouting visits, and the GM was present for their games. Which it's one thing to say, okay, he's at LSU. There's a million guys who could be watching. Yeah. When our GM goes to take in a South Carolina football game, who do you think he's watching? Probably Brian Edwards. So, and on top of that, you, you take into account the fact that the value of any good wide receiver class would seem to be in those middle rounds if it's as deep as advertised, it starts to tell you that maybe these people out there pounding the table for that first-round wide receiver, you need to open your open up your mind a little bit to the possibility that yeah. there could be more, there could very likely be an offensive tackle drafted early. If the Bills were drafting seventh, okay, it increases the odds of one of those wideouts coming to Buffalo. It, it lessens their uh, their pursuit of one in free agency because I know what we've seen so much about Brandon Bean is that he doubled doubled down so many times and I even mentioned it on uh, you know on, on a stream that we just did I did with Nate Geary and Greg Thompson you talk about uh, they they signed Jordan Phillips they draft Ed Oliver they signed Tyler Croft they draft Knox they signed Yeldon they draft mm-hmm. Singletary you know what I mean. He always wants to get that insurance policy mm-hmm. before going into the draft. You so, drafted Cody Ford, but you signed Ty and Secchi. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. And that's the, the cycle that he has. He always seems like he's one step ahead of need before they, they need, need it. it. And any good GM would be. Absolutely. So it seems like he's doing Which is rare right. in here. In well, yeah, it's rare here in Buffalo. So with that, you know, it, you, it's funny you mentioned cornerback as your other need for the team. You talk about two positions that have to be have to be addressed. Cornerback, obviously, you'd want... The Bills are lining themselves up to make Trey White probably the highest-paid cornerback in football. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no doubt that he's going to set the market when he signs a contract. Yes. I don't foresee this team letting him go. No, I mean, you look at the... Even within the division, I, I, you know, I, we have had discussions before about this, and I said that you got to get to the table faster than the Saints do with Marcus Lattimore because he may set the market for you. However, the market may have already been set with Xavier and Howard down in yes, the exactly. So uh, he's, he's going to get paid, but you have time to put the brakes on on Trey. You got him for at least two years. Mm-hmm. Okay, you got him this year. 
uh, next year, actually three years, this year, next year for the fifth year option, then you could franchise tag them if you wanted to. So you could conceivably have them for three years just sitting on your hands. There's a need for a legitimate starting number two cornerback on this team. Well, going back to our podcast last week, you're talking about the number of cornerbacks scouted by the Bills. Cornerbacks and safeties were the two highest, like, they, they were the most, defensive backs were the most scouted position this regular season of any any position on the board. Hmm. You Which never is, have enough DBs on your roster. Essentially, though, you got to look at it from, in terms of frugal roster building. I've already seen people out there doing podcasts and webcasts about off-season free agency needs, and I feel like it's way too early to start that conversation because you no know, franchise tags haven't been doled out yet, or at least we haven't heard rumblings of who's going to get franchised. But also, when you're taking a look at where this team is putting its onus on scouting, a good GM isn't going to go out and set a, assign a market-setting cornerback on one side and then go out and spend more money no. on, a, on a second cornerback so with that said, I think that there's going to be a real chance that in the early rounds of this draft, you see it, a cornerback taken by the Buffalo Bills. I, you know, first does it th- help to have Levi Wallace on that contract? Oh, it absolutely does. And oh, again, drafted. And, four. and that's why, that's why having guys like that around are integral to your roster, which is why the draft is so important. Yeah. You want a, a home run scenario for the Bills would be finding a cornerback in the first three rounds that can come in and start from you, start for you. Off the bus? Oh, my God. No more of this off the bus. If any GM ever uses the phrase starter off the bus immediately following a draft, he should be fired on the spot. Directly off the Uber. Yeah, right? A home run for us would be watching the Bills come out of those first three rounds with a second a second boundary cornerback that you can trust, and then you've got a guy who's a cheap replacement. He's an exclusive rights free agent. You own Levi Wallace for the foreseeable future. Yeah. With no, without having to make any major contract commitments. Mm-hmm. So and if he improves next year, he's a trade. Yes. You, know I mean? there, you have flexibility. Yeah. Uh, the, I just, I, I'm scared about the mutiny that would happen if you had, a ta- you went tackle first round and corner second round. Oh, yeah, mutiny that, would ha- that one Bills are. Oh, I can't believe what they did. But free agency, which happens, you know, March 18th, will determine, right or wrong, what happens at the draft. So if they go out and they get a tech, you know, I, a guy that's never been mentioned is Bates when he's been had to come in. He hasn't been horrible. Number one, Bates hasn't been terrible when he's had to come in. I know you're going to have to disagree with Dennis, and that's fine. And the fact that they kept Lee Adrian Weil the entire year. They could have released him under injury settlement and paid That's him. True. They kept him the entire year. I think they see something in him. Um, That's fair. That he's gonna, he might be in one of those spots, which is why you saw Cody Ford so much at tackle. If Adrian Waddle was healthy, and I know Adrian is more of a left tackle than a right tackle, however, that could have been something that happened. Maybe Cody Ford wasn't supposed to be our starting right tackle. Maybe he. They, the, maybe the plan wasn't to rotate with Inseki. And then when Waddell went out, went out, they said, okay, well, we'll give him a shot and see what works. We know what we have in Inseki. Mm-hmm. You saw that first game. The, they threw Ford out there at tackle. He struggled. So for the fourth quarter, they put Inseki in. Mm-hmm. And then the Bills go on to two scoring drives. It stabilized the line. Yeah. They go on to win the game. The next game, they give Ford another shot. But when he starts to struggle, okay, we're going to bring Ford in. I think last year was a test. And so with that, now you see them going into another offseason looking at a lot of tackle talent. That makes sense. Maybe they saw enough to see, hey, this is a this is a guy who's better off playing guard. Mm-hmm. Rather than compound a mistake by choosing to refusing to admit that we made it. Mm-hmm. Let's put him at his at a position of strength coming into this season, and let's make sure that we as a team are operating from a position of strength and that we have enhanced depth at that position. What about the the one thing from our podcast that we did with Dean that kind of blew me away that we really didn't do in scouting was the running back position. Like, where are running backs outside of Devin Singletary? 